Hello, everyone. Greetings, and uh, welcome to another Ed Innovator, Educator Innovator Hangout on air. It's March 13th, 2014, and my name is Christina, and I work for the National Writing Project, and I'm logging uh, in here from my home in Philadelphia. For those of you who may be less familiar with Educator Innovator, let me just take a couple seconds to say that the Educator Innovator Network is a network of networks. And if you visit the Educator Innovator's website, you'll see a list of like-minded partners and colleagues who are supporting learning and offering learning opportunities, um, both in, for inside and outside of school educators that share the goal of more powerful and connected learning for youth. Um, Ed Innovator is powered by the National Writing Project, and since the National Writing Project plays a key role in this conversation today, I just wanted to provide a little context for you, those of you who might be less familiar with our network. Um, and I'd encourage my colleagues here to elaborate, uh, too. Um, the National Writing Project is a peer-based network of educators, a network that is um, a set of individuals and local writing project communities of practice around the country. Uh, as well as a few international sites. We bring together educators across grades and disciplines, as well as in and outside of school, <clears throat> to focus on sharing our knowledge, our expertise, and developing leadership in improving literacy and connected learning for all. Today, I am super excited to introduce our guests, who are all colleagues from the National Writing Project. And they recently co-edited a collection called Teaching in the Connected Learning Classroom. This collection was just published about a week ago by the Digital Media and Learning Research Hub and is part of their series on connected learning. It's available now as a free PDF and also as an ebook. The collection is unique in its focus in in-school connected learning work and practices, and it's entirely sourced from examples of practice that teachers have shared online at the NWP Digitalist website. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so, lots to say. <laughs> Antero Garcia here, uh, from the Colorado State University Writing Project, was the lead editor for the collection, and I would say the original visionary behind the project, too. So, I want to kick it off with a conversation with Antero and ask him a few questions once everybody has a chance to introduce themselves. So why don't we start with you, Antero, and then I'll call out people's names because I don't know what order you're all in. For each other. <laughs> Hi everyone. I'm, just... I'm officially a visionary, according to Christina. I'll go on my title. Uh, yes. I'm at, I'm in Colorado, uh, at Colorado State University uh, here in Fort Collins, Colorado. Cindy? I'm also at Colorado State University. I'm a professor here and I direct the CSU Writing Project. Great. Uh, Cliff? Hey everybody, I'm Clifford Lee. I'm assistant professor at St. Mary's College of California in the Bay Area. Great. And Danielle. Hi, I'm Danielle Filipiak and I'm currently a PhD student in English education at Teachers College at Columbia University. Cool. And then Nicole? Hi, I'm Nicole Mira. I'm an education researcher at UCLA and a member of the UCLA Writing Project and the coordinator of the UCLA Council of Youth Research. Great. Thanks so much all for being here today. This is really exciting to have this chance to hang out with you all and celebrate the publication of this new collection. It's really exciting. Um, if Let me take a moment to say before we get started that if you're watching this hangout from the Ed Innovator um, blog page where the webinars are, you can. Um, we really encourage you to jump into the chat room and converse with others who are watching as well as raise questions there. And um, Jordan, who's sort of running um, the show in the background um, will um, share those questions with us here so we can bring them into the conversation. She'll also be posting resources out as we mention them throughout the course of the webinar. All right, so uh, let's start with Ontario. Um, so, you know, first of all, really congratulations um, and also thank you for getting this whole thing started. Um, I remember that it was essentially a year ago um, at last year's Digital Media and Learning Conference that you were talking about this idea and checking in with all of us about it. Like, do you think we can do this? What, what do you think? Do you want to do this? Uh, should we do this? And, you know, a year later, here it is. It's a reality. You guys made it happen. So I'm wondering if you could share with us a little bit about what motivated you and really inspired the original vision. 
Yeah, and, and I, I'd say that part of this is from the digital media and learning conference that happens every every year. Um, I, I tended to see it as a space where there's a lot of excitement and momentum, um, but not necessarily momentum um, towards what happens in schools and for classrooms and for what happens between uh, eight and three at any given day. Um, and as a result, I was really interested in, in trying to think through what are the what are the options in terms of bringing in a conversation, right? So you mentioned that for the people watching this today, um, offer comments in the in the chat, right? In terms of today's webinar, um, and I see I see the book here in terms of being um, a dialogue, right? And so instead of having uh, individuals who are, are saying, you know, here's what connected learning means in the classroom, um, I, I feel like we can crowdsource it with the amazing work that's already happening uh, for educators across the country. Um, instead of saying this is what needs to happen, we can say this is what is happening right now. Um, and so that's the that was the initial focus for this work. Um, and a year seems like a really long time, I think, just in terms of um, it seems like it seems like a long time um, from a teacher's perspective of you know that's a, that's an academic year. What did what happened for my students? Um, but if if I think about a year in terms of the slow laborious process of peer reviewed publications and blah blah blah. Um, I'm I'm excited about the kinds of momentum that we're able to move forward and where this work can go for teachers uh, moving ahead. Great, thank you. Um, I was looking back at your um, introduction to the piece today, um, which I think really sort of helps frame this idea that this book is a dialogue and um, feels very inviting in that way. Um, and one of the things that you write in there is that you want us to consider the possibility that teachers are environmental designers. Mm -hmm. And I just think that that's sort of a, I, I, I just, it would be great to hear you talk about that a little bit and how that um, frames what you brought together. So I guess the other way I, I, I would frame that in addition to being designers is that I think we should embrace teachers as theory builders, right? That oftentimes the work that, um, at least the, the pre-service teachers that oftentimes Cindy and I work with here at CSU um, expect to get the instructions. They're looking for the magic pill that's going to show them what to do in their classrooms. Um, and I think, speaking for Cindy, um, that we patently reject that. Right? That that's that's a that's a belief that we that doesn't work. And so, what what this book should function as is a way to show that teachers should be able to problematize and understand and develop inquiry questions <laughs> to to engage what happens in their classrooms on any given day. And so, as a result, like the, this idea of intentional design of what happens in your classroom really is a push against uh, best practices, which is also what I talk about in that book. So um, for people who are watching and aren't clear about best practices, it's this idea that um, very generally says, if there's something that works in one person's classroom, everyone should replicate that, because that'll work in everybody's classroom. And, and the problem is, you forget about the context of, of um, environmental context, the sociocultural environment, um, the many different factors that affect what happens in one classroom to another, let alone from one day to another, one class period to another. Um, and so this is really an opportunity to say, you know, we don't need best practices. Let's look at what's already happening um, and, and encourage you as, as readers of this book, as people who are going to engage in this dialogue in other spaces, um, to continue this conversation um, beyond just saying, here's, here's one example of what to do. Um, so I think that's, that's what I was thinking about for design, is, is taking that intentionality back and, and really deliberately um, giving teachers this, this empowered sense of what they can and, and should be able to do within their own classrooms. Um, and, and it's not a push against the Common Core, it's not a push against the kinds of expectations that happen in classrooms, it's saying you can do this and still follow, follow the kinds of expectations that your administrators can expect you to do so you don't get fired from one year to another. Right, 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 great. Um, and I think that there's a real, um, there's, a, there's a huge diversity of um, stories and um, I forget how you said it, sort of a, a messy diversity or a, you know, sort of exciting messy diversity of, of stories in here that um, take in, oh, it must be, you know, 18 to 20 classrooms. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you could, and there, it was a big collaboration with all of you as editors, too. So could you talk a little bit about how you designed this and, mm -hmm. and, and and who you brought together? Kind of yeah, and, and I would just let viewers know that Christina played a large part in helping with that organization and in writing a really powerful component to the book. So um, she's been modest in, in not mentioning that work, and I think it's significant <laughs> to recognize um, her role in this. Um, it really was about breaking apart the key principles of connected learning and figuring out who are the people who have interesting things in terms of collating and curating 
um, components of this, which is why I was really honored to be able to work with the people who are, who are present on this webinar um, and Bud Hunt, who's, who's not present on this webinar. Right. Um, but we'll be doing, I think, a, a, a radio session coming up soon. On April 10th. On April 10th. Um, and so it, in doing that, I think the way this came about is, um, and I think the reason it was written so quickly was we, we looked at existing powerful examples of what's happening in classrooms um, using the National Rhyme Project's online site, the digital is, um, digital is .nwp .org, um that really has, off, um, it has powerful living examples. So it's not just um, that people share what's happening in their classroom, but they engage in a dialogue, right? So um, Cindy's used uh, uh, digital is as a way to engage her students um, and have Danielle speak with them. There's this interesting conversation that emerges on there. We wanted to um, not recreate that, but, but capture moments and, and the spirit and intent of that as a way to show what's already happening. Um, and from there, we, we really spent uh, about a week up in Seattle together in a, in a room with lots of malt balls um, <laughs> and, and sugar um, that, and croquet um, to, to then be able to uh, compile, compile the bulk of the writing for this, which, which eventually got edited down into what people are able to download now for free. Great. Excellent. Yes, and we should emphasize that. Download now for free. So <laughs> that's exciting. Um, so I guess I, I was going to, um, unless anybody has some comments to make before we transition, I think it would be great to hear from the other editors um, just about the book and the section that you worked on and um, some of the pieces that you brought together. I just do we, we didn't really decide uh, if we want to go in an order or so. I think I, I, I vote to spice it up a little bit. I think Cliff should start a, start us off because he's going to be talking about two sections. All right. Why don't I talk about the expert opinion side first, which is my section on production-centered classroom. <laughs> Sounds great. So mainly this uh, principle of production-centered classroom it seems pretty obvious, right? The doing becomes trying. And what I talked about at the beginning of this section is just that it's not a novel concept that Dewey essentially talked about over 100 years ago. But what is unique is that we can bring it into a digital age with uh, some of the different tools that's available to us. And I even thought about the um, my own seventh grade elective model making classroom as an example of how this production centered classroom model can be an invaluable opportunity for students to be able to tinker, explore, test, problem solve a design challenge that they're presented with. And in that process, you're observing, analyzing, strategizing with peers, and ideally, hopefully, with others that are equally as passionate about whatever it is that you're working on. And the other aspect that I found to be really interesting and important is this just-in-time feedback. Often, you know, if we're working in isolation, we don't have the time to get ideas and feedback, criticisms, questions, and accolades from others so that we can constantly evolve and change and grow as a learner. So. One other part I want to emphasize is that the teacher is an instrumental part of this process because for this to happen, you really need to have a supportive and a nurturing classroom community where students are not afraid to take risk and collaborate with one another. And often, you know, we see that traditional direct instruction classroom with this transmission model of teaching with even, even technology classes where it's step by step, you know, step one, do this, step two it misses the opportunity for students to explore and challenge themselves and also make mistakes but learn from them. And the last part that I uh, emphasize is just I feel like is particularly salient and this is actually with Danielle's example um, with historically marginalized groups of students like giving them a chance to create and not just regurgitate information. In this process you're giving voice, agency and developing that social and cultural capital for students to produce something that is of value to them. And the other two examples that I highlighted were Jason Seller's English classroom where he offered opportunities for students to synthesize their developing composition skills through a web-based tool where they essentially created interactive fiction games, kind of like uh, using leveraging students' gaming interests and also producing it for an authentic audience in the storytelling format. And then uh, Christian McKay's interactive zine and uh, I know p every time people, he shows his work to folks, they're blown away by the combination of software, hardware, circuitry, multi-literacies, all in this one artifact, which is 
basically a, a play off of the traditional zine, but this is a multimodal interactive experience. Awesome. That is awesome, Cliff. Thank you. Who wants to pick up from Cliff's? I'll I'm, talk. Oh, go ahead. You want to go? Go ahead, Nicole. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think it was really exciting to be a part of this work, uh, mostly because uh, when that term connected learning came out, uh, oftentimes <laughs> when phrases are coined, it can be a little bit difficult um, to really pull apart exactly what it means and how it's relevant to classroom and out-of-classroom life. We start to get scared of these official terms that sound very philosophical and scary. Um, but but it, what was great about this book is that it takes all the different tenets of connected learning and kind of teases them apart, which in practice they're obviously not teased apart. You can't separate interest-driven learning from production-centered learning or participatory learning or academic learning. Uh, but what we're trying to do is just highlight each one so that we can get a little bit of a clearer example of what it means in practice. Uh, so I, I did the chapter on interest-driven learning, um, which I think is a good gateway for the rest of the chapters because... Uh, if we don't have a fire lit under students, if students are not passionate about what they're doing, uh, then it's difficult for them to buy into academic or any other kind of learning. Uh, so what I found really interesting about this idea of, of taking students' interests seriously is that uh, we're at a time in education policy where uh, there's so much pressure for students to accumulate a large body of knowledge uh, to be ready for college and career uh, that we often forget that the very common sense notion that students are most excited about learning when it starts from a place that they are interested in and that they're passionate about that relates to their own lives and their own experiences. Uh, so we really wanted to highlight the fact that uh, all the different aspects of learning that we want students to experience have to start from where students are in order for it to be meaningful and authentic and relevant to them. Uh, so. We brought together three uh, amazing teachers in this section who are doing work with students at various grade levels, both inside and outside of classrooms, to see how they're incorporating students' interests into very complex academic and socially relevant work. Uh, so Christopher Working is working with third grade students uh, in his classroom on blogging. So students are developing academic literacies while also having the chance to share their ideas and interests with students all over the country and all over the world. So they're learning not only about what it means to craft a post, to craft a piece of writing, but also to take what they're interested in and find an audience for it and connect to others around that interest. Uh, many times I think that we um, take children's interests as something that is cute or something that is extra, something that can be a gateway into more serious quote-unquote types of learning, uh, instead of really respecting the fact that students have very sophisticated complex interests and that they are developing into citizens and that the interests they're exploring are not simply childish hobbies but they're often uh, ways that they're starting to develop their own identities. Um, so Christopher Working does a great job of showing how even with students as young as third grade we can really start to to build upon those interests and connect them with others through technology. Chuck Jurek also uh, contributed a really interesting piece about an after-school video production club that he runs with fourth and fifth graders uh, and what I found really fascinating about that piece is that it reminds us that writing uh, is now multi multimodal. So he's really focusing on what it means to write in the form of a script and then to write in the form of images and to be a director and to choose what to film and what not to film in order to express your point of view about something that you're interested in. Uh, so he really shows how students have to make complex decisions involving literacy in order to make something uh, that they care about in video form. Uh, and finally, Minu Rami, uh, who's got an amazing new book out that you should go check out. Uh, who She does work in Philadelphia with high school youth, and she, she and her students realized that there were many negative stereotypes about youth that look like them that they were seeing in the media, and they decided to create their own uh, magazine in order to give their own counter stories to the images they were seeing. Uh, so again, all of these different projects involved complex... Um, academic and social literacy skills, but they were powerful for students, and students got engaged to a level that they might not have otherwise because of the fact that it stemmed from something they cared deeply about, uh, about themselves and their <coughs> communities. So I think um, all three of these posts really got me excited about this idea that uh, when we see young people, when we take them seriously, 
as civic beings, as developing citizens whose interests are serious and can really inspire amazing social movements. Uh, that really gets to the heart of what makes learning connected because they're reaching out and they're engaging with other folks around their same interests. So I think that um, it was a really powerful experience to share that work. Thank you. So I'll go next. Um, I did the section on shared purpose and um, I'll admit initially when I, and I talked about this with Cindy's class, it was really difficult initially for me to wrap my head around when I was first introduced to the connected learning framework um, to the difference between interest driven and shared purpose. They sounded, you know, as someone new to the framework, they sounded very similar initially. And, um, and when I really started to kind of dig my teeth into it, I realized that it shared purpose was very much, it kind of disrupts the power dynamic in the classroom and that, um, and that shared purpose says that when, when adults and young people come together around a shared purpose that grows out of a need or a desire or a want, um, and they have multiple tools at their disposal to, to kind of investigate this need or desire, that powerful learning happens. And in curating this section, um, a few of my takeaways um, were that um, in thinking about teachers, as, as Ontario mentioned, as environmental designers, and thinking about this work across multiple contexts, that shared purpose essentially is that glue that holds everything together because it because we know that learning doesn't just happen magically it requires relationships it requires collaboration and when you have a genuine need in front of you that might not be <laughs> identified in the standards document everyone becomes invested and this kind of learning happens all the time outside of school right amongst communities but thinking about specifically the, din the dynamics of how that happens and how young people and adults come together and what they use in order to address their real needs, for me, in many ways, is very revolutionary. And thinking about um, how that can happen inside of a classroom, I think, is very encouraging. And so, um, and looking at my three contributors' work, um, I was very encouraged by um, Ethan. when we started discussing kind of how they were going to approach this, they had like an emerging sense of shared purpose even as they started, right, as they wrote their um, sections for the chapter. They kind of discovered that shared purpose was what held, you know, their classroom together and that it was something that emerged over time. So for instance, Jen Wolven um, talked about how her students were really upset about the, the way in which their um, high school was being portrayed in the media and eventually was threatened um, to be closed down and turned into a charter and that shared purpose of, of wanting to kind of disrupt that image and, and save their school, I guess you could say, um, really gelled the community and it was a really powerful um, account and, and Jen talks about um, just how, you know, watching that shared purpose unfold and really discovering how powerful that was um, for her. And Robert Rivera shares his account about working with fourth graders um, on a service learning project um, where they identified um, a community issue that they were really interested in addressing, pollution and water conservation, and how his primarily ELL students were really able to um, gain a stronger um, understanding of literacy and agency through investi investing in this project. And then finally, Bryce... Um, Bryce, who's over the Haru Foundation, um, a hip-hop organization in Detroit, talks about how images of young people in Detroit are oftentimes very problematic and um, contribute to, to negative points of self-identity. So the shared purpose in his context is thinking about how um, young people can generate their own media for their own positive points of self-identity um, for the purposes of self and community transformation. And so just thinking about all of this and, and curating this section was really um, even eye-opening for me because it wasn't necessarily about the product, but the process that everyone went through um, that allowed them to really commit to um, whatever was at hand. I mean, 
I think even in like you know Cliff mentioned like building a car, it might it, it's not necessarily building that car at the end that that makes students want to invest, but being with others and learning from them. And so um, I'll stop there because I know how to talk forever. <laughs> and I ever. Can, I can pick up there. It's okay. so great to see everybody. Everyone's been um, doing Google Hangouts with my own students and Ontario students at uh, Colorado State University that it's fun. I'm just getting used to your talking heads now and when I see you in the flesh <laughs> I don't know what will happen. <laughs> um, I teach as as um, we were saying earlier with the visionary Ontario Garcia and so um, some of the work that actually came out of the um, digital is that I wanted to focus on actually involved our students and I think that's an important thing to know but whenever I was and, and so that probably was actually the first um, curated piece that I thought about using in my section which really focuses on peer supported learning. Um, Ontario mentioned that you know our students in particular pre-service teachers and actually I think a lot of practicing teachers too are enamored by that idea of best practices and I think peer supported learning which was the principle I focused on is definitely considered one of those uh, best practices but there's actually a lot less that we know about how it looks in practice it's just something you know that teachers are expected to do in schools and it is emphasized in the uh, common core standards for instance even though it's not necessarily called peer supported learning there is a bit an mm -hmm. expectation that collaborative learning will occur and so I wanted to see um, you know in that connected part of connected learning that focuses on student relationships as I was looking through the digital is resources I was really interested in looking for teachers who were using peer supported learning in their classroom but I also wanted to think about you know what this looks like in a range of contexts and with a range of um, age groups and what does it look like when digital and multimodal tools become part of that mix um, and then you know I want I also wanted to think about schools in particular that are under surveillance which is the phrase that one of the vignette authors in my section actually used to talk about what was happening in her school um, she was a school and I'm talking about uh, Katie McKay here her school she teaches in uh, a, t a small title one school in Texas and they were on um, academic watch or what they called in Texas AU they were an AU school which means academically unaccept unacceptable um, and I was thinking as I was looking through um, you know those resources on digital is about how there's still this um, not on digital is itself but in the education the discourse about education I think in our culture that there's this idea of well you know this kind of learning could happen peer supported learning could happen with um, if, if all the conditions were absolutely right but it couldn't work with these kids or it couldn't work in uh, those schools and I, I really wanted to look for um, resources in digital is that would debunk that particular myth and I think Katie's uh, vignette does a really good do job of doing that because of the context where she was teaching one of the things that she does in this uh, fourth grade classroom too is she's working with really young learners to address the kind of critical literacy uh, themes that you're hearing come up in all of that my other co-editors uh, descriptions of their sections what she did was she did uh, organize a particular unit in her class around that shared purpose learning that Danielle was talking about and the question that they were all investigating was has Martin Luther King Jr's dream actually come true and can it come true in this day and age um, her particular context had even though it was small school had a, a high degree of racial and linguistic diversity and so what she discovered when those students were learning together was that there were a lot of microaggressions that are common to the culture at large that were also present in her classroom and were present in the community but as students worked together on this process that involved writing comic strips and creating slideshows and iMovies um, 
the digital nature of those projects and the multimodal nature of those projects require them to support one another in a way that they couldn't have uh, to accomplish a purpose they couldn't really have accomplished individually. The digital and multimodal part was really key to helping them develop a counter narrative to that idea that um, you know privilege, privilege is the way that people accomplish things like dreams in today's cultural context. Um, I, another one of the vignettes that I was looking at too showed how this peer supported learning occurs in a, a, a um, a context with very young learners. So Lacey Manship at the time taught in a, an urban school and she was teaching kindergarten um, and I think that's another group of people who are thought of as those kids. Like this kind of peer supported learning can't happen in a classroom. Little kids need you know a lot of teacher supervision. Um, they certainly can't learn with one another especially in a context like Lacey's which was also under surveillance. There was a scripted reading program in her classroom. Um, she talks about how often there were people in clipboards that, with clipboards that were walking around um, watching her students learn. But she made the decision that young kids can be um, producers and composers of learning too, that they aren't these empty vessels that have to get filled up with knowledge. And what she did was she made digital tools available in her classroom to all of her students. And they wound up documenting the learning that occurred um, throughout the entire year. And in the process, developed some counter narratives to uh, the ways that, that their school was being portrayed as you know, a school that was also in trouble um, as far as standardized achievement measures go. Um, I was really inspired by the fact that they were learning together and creating this critical dialogue and these counter -nar narratives even though they were such young learners. Um, and then the last group of teachers that I was looking at were actually pre-service teachers from Ontario's classroom who were working on a digital is resource themselves. Um, again, even though we don't think of pre-service teachers as kids, there is this sort of prevailing notion in the classroom that they are kind of learners like kindergartners might be. They're just on the other end of the process because they're learning to be teachers. Um, and Ontario does a really great job in his classroom of helping them think about themselves um, in, in the position of producers of knowledge that's also um, useful to an outside audience. Even though they may be novices to the profession, they have something to say. They have a unique perspective on issues like what is literacy, what is learning, that others might not have. And so he required the students as part of his class on teaching reading to create a digital as a resource that really took up some of these questions like what the relationship between literacy and power um, and rather than having them, you know, write a standard essay or an individual piece that only he would read, he challenged them to learn in public. Um, so in that way, they created, I think, a counter narrative that um, pushes back against this idea that very young people, whatever entry they have into the academic context, don't have anything to say. Um, the last thing I think that's interesting to me about their vignette was that they focused on, or they, they unveiled, I guess, what some folks have already talked about here, which is the messy side of learning. Um, it wasn't, you know, developing those projects together wasn't always a neat and easy thing, and they're very frank about that. But nonetheless, they talk about how it was a valuable experience for them and that it, it's going to shape what they do with their own students in their classrooms. And then I, um, the other chapter that um, I, I wrote was the academically oriented teaching chapter. Um, and, and kind of building off of what Cindy was talking about, um, the work that, we, that she mentioned that happened in my classroom that um, is profiled in the book is really to help educators think about who are the experts, right? And how do we learn and share this information publicly? Um, so whether it's our pre-service teachers who may not feel like they have something significant to add to a professional discourse yet, um, or it's the students in our classroom now, or it's the teacher down the hall who might be feeling burnt out after years and years of um, degradation from the district, you know, how do we transform those conversations um, publicly? 
um, how do we change that culture, right? And the other culture that needs to be changed that we've heard about is that these kids culture conversation, right? That this stuff is great when it happens in this fancy public school, right, or in this, this fancy private school, um, or this happens in this more affluent area of the community, but how do we help all of these kids, right? Um, and it's not even the health narrative. Marcel Haddix was out here uh, talking to uh, our students a couple weeks ago and really challenged educators to think about, are we going into communities with this assumption of helping them, or are we going into these spaces as a ways to contribute to our own community, and where do we see ourselves in that conversation? Um, and I think um, this ebook should be a space for us to think about that from the academic perspective. So the academically oriented section um, is probably where, where educators think they see all the stuff that you expect to see in classrooms, right? That it's, you do all this cool stuff that's in the other five chapters of the book, and the academic stuff is the stuff that shows up on tests at the end of the year, and that's not how it should go. Um, they, should be they should be ingrained, they should be enmeshed with each other. Um, so the examples in, in this chapter from Janelle, Larissa, and Nick, um, really demonstrate from the ground up different perspectives on how academically oriented teaching um, can emerge within classrooms that are doing powerful and fun things, right? Heaven forbid you use the F word. Um, and so uh, the F word being fun, sorry, I'm realizing that there's several <laughs> F words uh, that could be chosen here. Um, but like Janelle talks about um, inquiry, right? From a professional development stance, how do I reorient the kinds of academic practices of my classroom? Um, Larissa thinks about the kinds of essay and academic writing that exists in classrooms. So instead of pushing against the five paragraph essay, and if you ever um, are in a room with Cindy, you should just say five paragraph essay and, and see what happens. Um, and, and Nick talks about the use of comic books with young people and thinking about what the kinds of opportunities that um, can emerge when you think about orienting classrooms around academic principles that are also engaging, right? Um, so if I think back to um, what Danielle and Cliff were saying a few minutes ago, some of the key words that I really heard aren't about the standards or the flashy devices that we think about um, both in academic principle, academic settings, um, or the flashy technology stuff that we think about um, in, D in the DML space, the digital media and learning space, um, but it's around questions of relationships, right? It's, it's about collaboration, and it's about equity. And for me, academically oriented teaching should start with those as the base principles, as should anything that's happening in our classrooms, right? And then the F word again, right? Is it fun? Um, is it fun for kids to be able to do the kinds of writing we're demanding of them? Um, and then I just want to piggyback off of Daniel's word again of revolutionary, right? That this should be a revolutionary practice of what's happening in our classrooms. I think it's intentional for us to see what's happening now to push forward a teaching profession that's being challenged today in, in today's um, and the ways we're interpreting standards and reform. Um, and so I, I would hope that teachers read this book and see themselves as uh, civic agents and that um, Nicole's been talking about this recently about students also seeing themselves as civic agents. Um, so as, as a brief example, um, last month I, I had the opportunity to co-host the NCTE chat um, and we had hundreds of teachers from around the country um, who voluntarily talked about um, formative assessment in their spare time. Um, to the extent that it was trending on Twitter, right? That's amazing um, if we think about the sleeping giant, right? How many teachers around the world who are excited and engaged in something like formative assessment, right? Um, which, which in our pre-service teachers can, can elicit eye rolls, right? This is an opportunity for us to reinvent academic or oriented teaching together. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the things that I was really excited about with, with this chapter of the book. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, there were, uh, there's another chapter that Bud Hunt actually edited. Cliff, did you want to give a little sense of that yeah. one too? Yeah. So I was really generously volu volunteered with my colleagues to uh, speak for Bud. Hey, Bud, <laughs> hope you're enjoying this and hope I do justice to your section. Um, so Bud's section is openly networked. And like a lot of the different things that we've talked about already, I think there's a lot of overlap between each of the, these different sections. I mean, it's a fairly simple concept, right? We hear it often in, uh, around digital spaces. Uh, Bud began by just talking about his own experience, which was as a practitioner in the classroom. He noticed that he wanted to share his practice, and he noticed that people were documenting, questioning, sharing their online practices with one another through blogs, podcasts, and basically how I kind of looked at it is troubleshooting the teaching profession together with other folks that are similarly minded in uh, sharing their practice with each other. But then he gets, he looks at the complexities and the nuances of this openly networked principle that the opportunities for learners to access a wide range of knowledge and resources that's uninhibited by traditional and physical boundaries. And I think this is a really big important concept that is 
different than like say just doing your PD within your school. Now you have a chance to say hone in on one specific. Say you're interested, you're a social studies teacher looking at project-based learning through a culturally responsive lens. You can find other people like that through these online spaces. And the other emphasis that uh, he wanted to focus on that's a little different than the original connected learning text was that instead of just looking at students, he just saw the opportunities are ripe for teachers to collaborate and discover and connect with one another. Um, and also find connections with those that share, like I mentioned already, the similar passions. And then finally, the other major point that I thought was really powerful that he talked about is the idea of, and similar to what we've been talking about, is even though these exist in you know digital spaces and these principles were somewhat founded in these ideas, they can occur in, as he described, analog or even other spaces. But it's just the idea that you create opportunities for students and teachers to discover others who love what they know and want to share that love with others. And that's exact words from his text that I thought was really important. Um, but the key is really being intentional about what, when, and how they share their work. And he described two ideas that he kind of coined about this, which is purposeful transparency, being very thoughtful and deliberate about what you share. And then on the flip side, the productive eavesdropping, letting others in at opportune times to really examine the work. And I think the three examples that he chose really highlight this. Gail Dessler, she's a, a district employee, and she basically helped classroom teachers connect to the world and with each other. She invited teachers to explore similar topics uh, together, um, but it also requires a certain awareness that others are doing what they're doing. Um, with Adam Mackey and Jenny St. Romain, they describe an experience of moving from classroom to the community as a uh, and discovering new partners along the way and they deliberately reached out to experts in the community so that they could share their expertise with their students as well. And then finally he described uh, Mike Morosky's focus on both the physical space of his museum as well as the online ex environments that can help to build community and connections around museum educators shared interests. So what is interesting is all of these are both digital, analog, and as he describes, something else entirely. But the key is that these are all examples where a group of people are learning together in community where they gain much deeper insight, better learning, and in much longer lasting ways. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, really nicely done, Cliff. I know that wasn't your uh, section, so hats off. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so just, to, I mean, this learning together in community, I feel like that's really what this is about. And um, I don't know, and Tara and I have joked about, you know, like you start walking around, you talk about connected learning, connected learning, connected learning, you feel like it's this thing. <laughs> and, and you're promoting it or something. And But really, it is this, it's a set of, um, uh, it's a description that comes from research and from looking at how youth learn and um, and direct their learning in in digitally rich and networked environments. But then it helps its language that we can use to sort of talk through some of the things we're also seeing in classrooms and really think about how do we support all youth. And I feel like just listening to you guys, then you know it's just sort of a beautiful set of. Um, dialogues around this work that I think complexifies it in the way that it deserves to be complexified um, and or the, the way it is complex <laughs> and um, that you know and then when you actually read the pieces and all the, the, the layers that are in those pieces too I think it's a really um, deep look at what's possible and also what is actually happening um, so I guess I wanted to um, just open it up and encourage people in the chat right now to also send in comments or questions if you have any and um, we'd like to bring them into the conversation but um, we had kind of set a question for ourselves like you know where does this take us next we haven't really had a, comp a chance I mean you guys have been working with this stuff in various ways since you have put this together and now it's public and so Maybe we could talk a little bit about where this takes us next, both for um, you know classroom and classroom-based work, and um, in our our professional learning communities and our uh, communities of practice ourselves. 
I can address that, Christina. Um, I've like I think I mentioned whenever I was talking my monologue that all these I've invited all the, the co-authors into my classroom. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm teaching a class, a methods class right now, and it is populated with some of you know students in that particular class um, expect to really do focus on the how to. And the great thing about bringing my co-editors in has been that they they have talked about the how to, but they've also really emphasized the why to. And the connected learning principles have been really powerful for my students in that regard. I hear them taking up the language um, that is mentioned in the book, and they've had this opportunity to really know, learn um, not just from the co-editors, but also from those other vignettes. I'll hear them saying, well, but what's the shared purpose in this unit? And um, how are we going to really focus on the academics, too? What are some essential questions that we can, can um, you know, focus on in this particular unit? And so I, I just really love seeing that um, in um, really, you know, <clears throat> evident ways every single time I, I step into my classroom. The other thing that we've done besides, you know, pointing students out to those digital list pieces is that we've started uh, recording these on Hangouts or scribe, students have scribed um, in the cases where Ontario didn't help me set a Hangout up or wasn't, you know, as visionary as we all like to think he is um, because he was doing things like picking people up at the airport. Anyway, which was also important for my students because he was bringing speakers in. but. Um, I don't know, it's just, it's been really cool to see how all interconnected this work is and how we're able to use uh, digital tools, um, you know, to push, continue pushing it out in ways that I think are going to have a real impact on students' lives who are going to be teachers. They are, they're citing, I, I sent a, a text to all of these folks yesterday and said, my students are citing you and saying that, you know, you make theory real. We can actually see it in action. And so, that's been a um, you know a thing that you guys can who are, are watching and listening can take advantage of too because those hangouts are available on my uh, class website. Great, right. and I was also going to say that there are some um, dialogues that we shared on digital is too. Um, so yes, I think they're really interesting in their layers. Yeah, I wanted to piggyback off of what. Cindy is saying because I, I do think there is something very special about the fact that this is an ebook. It is online, and it, that speaks to something about um, its capacity to, to grow and change. Uh, and the fact that these were all resources that were drawn from the internet, uh, from teachers who are doing this work, and the of work that is constantly changing on digital is, which I think is really important. Um, because, like Ontario and others have said at the beginning, that we are consciously not making this about best practices, and I think that's really important to emphasize because, like we were saying, best practices tends to imply that there is a certain uh, kind of canonized practice that has now become the thing that you are supposed to do, the good thing to do. And I think every time you create canonized practice that it becomes uh, devoid of any context or variation and it becomes calcified and not very useful for teachers, uh, I know it always turned me off in the classroom to think that this is supposed to be the one and only way that it can be done without the folks knowing my students and my classroom and the context that we were working in. Um, so that's why I think this kind of work, and just the same way that classroom practice can't be canonized, student interests can't be canonized. We can't just assume uh, because I have 15-year-olds that live in X location, I know what they're into, I know what kids are uh, like, uh, without actually speaking and getting to know the students that you have in front of you. Uh, so I think it's really important that we have all of these online spaces for educators to share. Um, the Common Core is rolling out across the country and many educators don't feel that they have a sense of agency over um, how those standards are rolling out and what they mean. So I think that having a space where educators can share what they're doing and how it does relate back to standards but also goes beyond to reach their students where they, where they are and where they need to be in ways that are meaningful uh, can make this a really important ongoing conversation. Uh, and I, I want to add to that um, just really briefly that um, I think I think about what Nicole's saying in terms of not just needing an online community but also um, needing some kind of support for it, right? So uh, like the, the the six of us and Christina who helped create this, I, I think the reason it, it was such a fun project to work on is because um, I, I feel like we're we're a strong community of collaborators, right? So um, half the time when we're not 
talking and in this space in, in an academic conversation um, we, we joke and have fun and, and goof around and I think part of that is, is necessary work. A civic researcher uh, Joe Westheimer talks about 50% uh, of social justice is social, right? And I think I think we forget about that as teachers, as as uh, classroom teachers, um, and as a community. That part of being a community is being able to laugh with each other and being able to joke and being able to have a good time. Because ultimately, that's what's going to also help motivate um, and drive things. Cindy's reminding me that booze also helps, which is not necessarily involved with with the creation of this ebook, right? But but that being but being able to socialize and communicate with each other um, informally, I think, is a is a necessary step. Um, and I'm sorry, Danielle, for, for talking over you a second ago. So That's okay. That's what visionaries do. Um, <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to say, I, I think something that really gives me a lot of hope is that this is allowing us to, to have a, um, a different vocabulary to talk about what we're doing. Um, and I think that the wrong people have gotten a hold of you know, um, vocabulary to describe what it means to be intelligent or what the purpose of education is. And I think that, you know, for teachers, um, you know, we need to be able to talk about what's happening inside of our classrooms. And I think that the connected learning model really helps us be able to talk about it in ways that, that benefit young people and benefit us as teachers inside of classrooms. And um, so I just wanted to say that I think that in working with student teachers and sharing it with some of my teacher friends, that's been some of the feedback. And then they say, you know, wow, this is really gives me a way to talk about what I'm trying to do, but what I just couldn't really name before. I didn't have anything to really reference prior to this that seemed succinct and inclusive. Um, so I'm grateful for that. And that is all. Um, so I was I was thinking that maybe um, for the sake of um, you know ending on time, but then also inviting people to be part of ongoing discussions, we could talk about um, what well, we have. We already mentioned there's a NWP radio show on April 10th that uh, Bud Hunt will um, be one of the main guests and help us think about. Um, this work in the context, particularly of writing projects, but um, other uh, communities of practice I would invite in general. And then um, we also are um, uh, hosting a Connected Learning TV webinar series that um, Ontario and Nicole are currently working on. So, um, and that's another opportunity to continue these conversations and also really dig into some of the cross-cutting themes that come up across these um, chapters and um, different authors from the book will also be involved in that. So Ontario and Nicole, do you want to talk about the series a little bit? Sure. Uh, I, th I think the series is really an opportunity for us to delve into this and not just go chapter by chapter, right? So you're not going to see sections. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so the webinar starts in two weeks and it's going to be it's going to run every Tuesday in April. Um, and while you'll see some of these faces throughout, you'll see all of these faces throughout, um, the, the goal isn't to go and, and spend time looking at the academic oriented section or to look at uh, openly network section, but it really is an opportunity for us to think across area, across um, all, of the, all of the book to think about um, what are the major issues that we can bring in a conversation, right? So if, if you're watching this and you're interested in being involved in that conversation, this, is, this should be a productive space. It's not for a bunch of floating talking heads um, to, to tell you what things are, right? That's again moving to that best practices model. But instead, it's a space for us to hear your voice, right? It's why we keep asking what, what's going on in the chat and I hope to see some of you in the Connected Learning chat in two weeks. Um, Nicole, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's an important opportunity for people to come together across different spaces because many times those of us that work either in the classroom become disconnected from those who are working in research or be they become disconnected from those who are working in after school spaces. A lot of times uh, it's very easy to become isolated and get into our silos and be talking to the same people. Uh, so we're really making an effort with these webinars to bring folks together who are specialists in different fields, people that are uh, in the classroom, out of the classroom, at the university level, in many different spaces. Uh, in order to kind of show what happens when we bring all of our experiences together and the kinds of new insights that we can come to so that we can start to build on this work. We'll be looking at topics ranging from civic engagement to different pathways for learning to equity and access. So all the major themes that have been uh, cross-cutting this entire ebook, we really want to give a chance to 
get all of you engaged in that conversation on a deeper level uh, so we can really make sure that this is working and is valuable for people no matter where they where they work and who they work with. Great. And um, we were gonna we're looking to end the month with a big unhangout. We're hoping um, and hoping to invite uh, many educators to come and play with us in that sort of collective space and really dig into this stuff together in a um, multiple hangout space that uh, MIT Media Lab has been developing. So we're excited to have a chance to play with that too. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we do, I have some closing things to say, but why don't we do some, you know, final thoughts, um, closing thoughts, everybody. I wasn't going to call you out, but. I can start us off. The, um, <laughs> I guess the main thing that I'm left with as, as we think about this, both when I think about the, the community that we have here, those of us that have worked together, and when I think about the book and the, the authors that are on Digital Is, I think the main word here that, that keeps coming up is obviously connection. And it's not just because of the technology, it's because of the actual social ties that wind up coming out of technology. Um, a lot of us around the country have seen that our school districts and others are very quick to want to integrate technology. It's very popular right now, and we want to get it into everyone's hands. And we here in Los Angeles, we, we care about iPads and other places. It's different tools, but the, the tools, we have to remember, the tools don't mean much unless we know how to use them to connect. That is the purpose. If they're simply being used as another uh, a new way to write, then instead of writing on paper, we write in an iPad, then it's not really reaching its full potential, and it's not helping students learn and participate and connect in their learning. So I, I, we hope that this will be a resource to really connect each other as educators, but also connect us to our students and to people working in other spaces so that we can help support students. The thing that I would add to this is that um, teachers are learners in this process too, um, and that doesn't always come through. You know, even the ways um, that connected learning is talked about in the original book that that forwarded these ideas that Mimi Ito and some others um, shared with us. Even the way that gets talked about is that students are doing this all by themselves. But there are a lot. There's a lot of teacher support that goes into this and the only way that, that teachers I think are going to grow themselves is if they ask questions and they're willing to learn alongside their students in ways that are going to help um, actualize connected learning in classrooms. I'll chime in. Um, you know one of the things that I think somebody mentioned uh, just a little bit ago about Common Core and I think in this what with the exception of what three states now pretty much we are in the age of common core so this is a I know front and center for a lot of folks practitioners as well as uh, different folks related connected to education and as I'm just kind of skimming through the table of contents again and just looking at you know the six principles that we've been talking about this uh, during this talk there, I mean, what kind of what Glory Ladson Billings described, but that's just good teaching. I mean, a lot of these things, I think, expert, master, whatever you want to call them, teachers that have been doing it and doing it well for a number of years, this is what they do in their classroom. I mean, making it interesting, peer supported learning, academically oriented, production center, openly networked, shared purpose, all these things are critical aspects of developing the type of uh, critical thinking practices that we want to employ, and that what even the Common Core at its uh, theoretical beginnings, I think, tried to do. So I, I think that um, in light of the realities of what you know, teachers have to deal with, it doesn't have to be a dichotomy that we have to say is either or, but I think you, a successful teacher, effective teacher, can learn to navigate through these uh, waters with these practices, these principles, um, while still pushing for the type of rigorous, high standards that is expected of their students. I guess on that end, um, 20, 15 seconds, um, I've learned um, through working with all of you and curating this chapter that, that this work cannot be, you cannot do this alone. And that um, I think that teachers who are picking up this book, or any educator that picks up this book, needs to, you know, make more attempts to really connect to folks outside of their classroom. You know, we can no longer, we're, we're in a time 
that we can no longer just rely on ourselves with this work and that we have to find ways to be in relationship with other adults and young people around around us to make this work and so that's that's my takeaway and I think both at the national and at the, the local level the, the writing project really does a good jam, example of exemplifying what Danielle is saying mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think this work if anything highlights the power of, of network teachers across the country across the country mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's powerful and I'm that's it that's, that's perfect. Uh, thank you, Ontario. And thank you, everybody, for making this time, for working on this book, for con conceptualizing it together and, you know, working through all that stuff that you needed to work through with your malt balls. And I'd like, I'm, it's, it's very exciting that um, we have this uh, collection to continue these conversations. So thank you. Um, and we are going to call it a wrap. Um, I want to remind everybody that the collection we've been talking about is downloadable as a free PDF and also available as an ebook. Um, we'd love to hear from you um, about the book if you'd like to, and continue dialogue around it uh, would be great. Um, NWP Digital is, is an open website where you are welcome to join and share your work, cross post, publish directly there if you want. We really welcome your participation in the site, and we um, look forward to continuing to learn from you um, and educators in general about digital literacy and connected learning, and um, to just continue um, this great uh, dialogue. If you'd like to keep abreast of future opportunities and resources from Educator Innovator and the, and the partners of the Educator Innovator Initiative, um, including this upcoming summer of making and connecting, you should sign up for our monthly newsletter, and the URL is ed educatorinnovator.org. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a nice thank evening. You. Thank you.